Hello, everybody. New show, new moment, new week. It is the the end of the week of April the 23rd, 2021. And that was the week is our new Friday show about technology and particularly about innovation in technology, how it's fundamentally changing the world. Um, And uh, the show, for some of you, uh, will be familiar. It used to be a show between Keith Tier and I where we would talk about the weekly events, but we've broadened it today and have invited two other very creative guests onto the show. So let me introduce you To our guests, we have uh, Keith Teer, who is, um, amongst other things, the publisher of That Was The Week. Uh, We have um, Aurora Munro. She's the co-founder of Sovereign. She's somewhere in Panama, and this is her image. Uh, I don't know what she looks like, but she tends to be anonymous. Hello, Aurora. Hi. Nice to meet you, at least uh, your your avatar. Um, and uh, last but not least, and his name is not Aurora, his name is David Johnson. He goes by Dave. Uh, he's a very distinguished lecturer at Stanford Law School, one of the more creative souls in the valley. Um, so uh, Dave is just north in Marin County. Keith is just south in uh, Palo Alto, I'm in San Francisco, and Aurora is somewhere in Panama. Uh, today, we have an interesting subject. Uh, according to Keith, at least, for his That Was The Week newsletter for April the 23rd, it's the blockchain moment in world history. Keith, uh, a former Marxist turned venture capitalist, is an expert on world history. And this is what he wrote in this week's newsletter. Uh, in terms of the blockchain moment. Humanity uh, has evolved, uh, since forever, has evolved into larger, more integrated civilizations, from cavemen to early settlements to village, then towns, then regions, and now nations with a world economy. We humans build larger and larger scale interdependencies. He goes on, but basically what uh, Keith suggests is that we're at the blockchain moment when it comes to world history. Uh, Keith, very briefly, because uh, I want to share this conversation with everyone, what does the blockchain moment mean in your mind? It's really when um, economics and infrastructure drive a global interdependence uh, that is either over the top of or under the, uh, underneath of nation states, and every trend is for human beings to, uh, to be closer, more closely connected, free of intermediaries. Um, yet we still live, live in a social system made up of nation states and divisions. So every trend that you see is against those divisions, is for um, a singular human race that is both decentralized but also interdependent. Yet um, the social system we live in isn't. And blockchain, uh, just like in a previous area, uh, TCPIP, is essentially a globalizer and a creator of interdependence, free of intermediaries. Uh, Let me move on to uh, Aurora. Aurora, you're the co-founder of of Sovereign, which is a uh, a, a DAO, uh, a decentralized autonomous uh, organization focused on, on, on cryptocurrency. Uh, you're a practitioner rather than a theorist. Uh, but do you agree with Keith that we are at the, the blockchain moment in world history in terms of this decentralization? Um, yes, certainly. Um, at least I hope so. <laughs> but yeah, I think that it is playing an important role and it is going to change the way we know the world right now. Your own biography, uh, Aurora, fits into this. Uh, as is obvious, you've chosen not to show your face. 
you're from uh, Africa originally. You're from, a, a, I think, a Muslim family. And you've chosen, I think, to remain anonymous because of perhaps some social or cultural reasons. To what extent do these changes in cryptocurrency enable your kind of life, your anonymity, the fact that we don't know who or where you are. We know you're in Panama and that's pretty much it. In other words, it's more than just cryptocurrency, isn't it? It's a, a socio-cultural revolution, this, 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 this moment in world history, the blockchain moment. That's true. Um, but just quickly, briefly speaking about my pseudonymity. So here the reason is not just potential cultural issues, but also the fact that people tend to put their trust into other people or institutions they know instead of actually doing research and looking into what the hell they're using. Um, so I choose to be pseudonymous because I do not want to be seen as who I am, but instead as what I'm doing. So, and I also want to get our users on our system to know that they can always verify what we're doing and they do not have to put any trust in any person standing behind the project. Um, so just briefly on this topic and because you asked how crypto and blockchain is influencing my current lifestyle, I would say that, yes, um, due to the decentralized structure of our organization, and because anyone can basically contribute and all we have to know is kind of a wallet address, <laughs> this certainly helps with staying pseudonymous and is offering more possibilities. Well, Dave, uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell am I doing on, on this kind of weird show with these other characters? I, I brought you on as uh, a voice of sanity, the lecturer in Stanford Law School. Keith is a, is a kind of crazy pioneering investor. Uh, Aurora is obviously someone who is practicing this decentralized autonomous lifestyle. Are we, in your mind, Dave, as, as, as a thinker, as a broad, eclectic thinker on tech and society and someone very interested in design, are we really at this blockchain moment in your mind? So let me, let me play off uh, what Keith said. Uh, I'm not an expert in blockchain, so I'm not going uh, to avoid that phrase for the moment. But... I agree with Keith that the nation state is at risk uh, legally, jurisdictionally, uh, as well as functionally, operationally, economically, et cetera. So there really is, and I agree with this, a movement underneath or above or both that is towards a more unified, globalized uh, uh, society, perhaps loosely organized, but highly aligned, um, that is going to put an enormous amount of pressure on the old, staid, uh, brittle, but inflexible nation state structure that has been in control for, you know, if you really think of nation states expansively for a couple of thousand years. So, if that is what he means by the blockchain moment, then yeah, I would agree. I would sign on. There's there's something going on there. I assume that by the blockchain aspect, he means there is technology now that allows, that empowers people to further their participation in these extra jurisdictional uh, societal functions, whether they be social, uh, physical movement, uh, anonymity, and of course, economic, then yes, I, I, I think that there, that's a real, uh, I, not, I wouldn't say risk, real likelihood. It's very uncertain where it will go uh, because nation states uh, and the power that exists in nation states, meaning military power and other kinds of power uh, is not going to go quietly into that dark night with respect to this 
uh, overall movement. And by the way, I'm writing a book now on climate change and activism, and I suspect that this movement is going to find a great deal of affinity with climate change activism uh, that is going to look back and uh, I would argue get very forceful with the two majority structures in the world. And that is corporate wealth and its influence over government. And both of those things are, go we're going to see a rising conflict between those two things, global population organizing itself and government and corporate power being uh, uh, called out with respect to its impact uh, on a declining climate situation. Yeah, and it's funny, Dave, that you, you talk about the environment because one of the, the pieces that Keith flags this week in That Was The Week uh, a crypto artist who are now using Ethereum NFTs to fight climate change. Uh, not everyone, of course, will know what an NFT is. So mm -hmm. I am going to uh, tell you uh, an NFT is a non-fungible token. Um, uh, Aurora, perhaps you might talk a little bit more about uh, NFTs and, and, and how you share Keith's um, and... Uh, and Dave's idea of this technology making the world a better place. Sure. So like you said, NFT stands for non-fungible token, which is basically a, just to distinguish it from the regular tokens that you're speaking in um, cryptocurrencies, like a lot of cryptocurrencies are tokens and they're fungible and not distinguishable from each other. While an NFT is a smart contract where each of its tokens is identifiable and it can be linked with data like images in this case. So this technology itself is not going to change anything. It's like with all technologies, it's the question of how we're using it. So this is in general all about blockchain. You can use blockchain as just a technology and you can use it to build that many different applications and really use it to make okay, this earth a better place in many ways. And like any technology, you can use it for whatever purpose. So it doesn't always have to be good. Keith, perhaps you might respond in particular to what Dave has said, because he, he sounds very much uh, in your camp, uh, you see the nation state as the biggest enemy of the blockchain moment. You, uh, uh, you say, um, since 1994, the communications and publishing infrastructure of the world has become uh, fully global. It fails only when nation states seek to block it. So I assume you're very much on the same page as Dave and indeed Aurora when it comes to these structural shifts. Yeah, although I'm not really taking an activist stance there. It's more of a logical proposition. Um, it, it seems to me that incumbents who are threatened by change, especially when the incumbent has both power and authority and, uh, and resources, um, will always try to slow it down or stop it. You know, I, I created the first internet service provider in Europe, and I can still remember British Telecom uh, desperately trying to slow us down and stop us. Hmm. At the same time, they wanted to sell to us and they, they cut a deal with us where if we bought bandwidth from them, they would give us several years of exclusivity for home-delivered internet. And it's, the same is true of nation states. Um, the blockchain is going to allow value to leak out of the financial system that nation states uh, run. Uh, the Federal Reserve, money printing, taxation. Uh, lots and lots of value is going to escape from that in a way that nation states really can't stop. But ju just as, um, you know, when, when Florence was a city-state during the birth of Italy, uh, it took a bloody war to, for the Italian nation-state to be formed from the previous city-state infrastructure, it's very unlikely, and I agree with Dave here, very, very unlikely that nation states will welcome, allow um, 
uh, or permit in any way this globalized infrastructure that puts human beings into a single system, um, uh, but but does an end around the nation state system. It's likely that there'll be some reaction. It oh. will not be effective, as we've seen in China, uh, a government that seeks to block everything really can't. Uh, most savvy Chinese citizens know how to get access to content that is disallowed in their country because it's easy. So technology makes it almost impossible to stop, but there will be attempts to stop it. And that leads to blockchain becoming a political animal. Um, you know, we saw the SEC's reaction to ICOs. Um, uh, 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 attempting to depict tokens as securities, for example. Uh, it, it's going to be a fight, but uh, if you really want the, the kind of the Star Trek version of the future, where everyone in the spaceship comes from different cultures, but is all part of the same human race, it, it feels to me that the evolution of this technology and freeing it from government restrictions is the way to go. Uh, let, let, let's go back to Dave. Dave, um, you're in Marin County, but you teach at this very august institution, Stanford Law School, the heart of the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, in this next wave of innovation, will Stanford Law School, will the law, will Palo Alto remain the center of the tech world? Or is the world that you're imagining this deeply disruptive one that will undermine nation states, these decentralized networks? Is it really going to change everything? Will Silicon Valley eventually be a footnote in the 21st century technological disruption? Interesting question. I think um, there's a variety of opinions on this, and, and I, don't, I don't think anybody has a monopoly on the accurate projection of, of where this will go. My two cents is um, there's, there, you know, looking backwards, there's really good hard evidence for why Silicon Valley occurred in the geographical position that it is. Stanford uh, and uh, government contracts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the, the growth of computing. Um, that's kind of all good solid history. With globalization, uh, and distribution of knowledge, distribution of education, such as Coursera, Udacity, and the other global platforms that are delivering high uh, quality education, including, you know, Harvard and Stanford are distributing their education as well. Um, it becomes possible then to be well enough trained to implement your innovation. It's one thing to have an idea. Silicon, if Silicon Valley, Valley tells you anything, having an idea is the easiest part of having a successful startup. Uh, it allows anybody anywhere to uh, implement, start implementing their idea, their innovative idea, and finding the team anywhere distributed all over the world to help them build it. So yes, I think we're going to see more distribution, but not a fixed pie distribution, we're going to see an expanding pie. So there's more innovation than innovative, quote unquote, innovative centers that we know of now, whether it be Silicon Valley, uh, San Diego, Austin, Texas, New York City, et cetera, et cetera, Boston. Um, we're going to see, you know, hundreds of such groupings in mostly virtual space. You know, I'd say within 20 years from now, maybe even less. There's some already, to be honest. But um, will it leave Silicon Valley as a footnote? I don't know, footnote, maybe not. But it's certainly worthy worthy of a couple of pages in the history books of uh, innovation and technology. Talk to me also a little bit, Dave, about the the impact on the law. You're on the you're 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 a pioneer in 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 <laughs> in the law of technology and in the changing structure of the law. How is how are these profound shifts going to change the law itself? Yeah, you know, I just finished a fifty page article on this point, um, and uh, the research. You know, maybe this is self-fulfilling, but the research sort of reinforced my intuitions, which 
for my entire career in law from begin, you know, starting in the courtrooms uh, and heading off to academia, I've always felt, and I think it's accurate to say, the law always lags behind change in society. And there's a good reason for that. But the problem is in the last 50 years, the rate of change in society has accelerated massively in a way that law, quote unquote, has not been spun up to keep up. So the gap between law and bleeding edge technology has just been increasing. And I don't see law finding the magic a uh, solution to catch up. So law, I, I'm convinced law will always be trailing behind. And this in a way informs what I was saying earlier uh, with respect to Keith's comment, which is the, 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 the less effective law can be in keeping up with technology, the more room technology has to empower global uh, systemization of people independent of nation states, nation state jurisdiction, nation state law, and uh, freedom starts to uh, expand uh, a little bit like the expanding universe model. And uh, law is always going to be trying to catch up. The interesting question you know, that pops into my head was something Elon Musk posed, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I think maybe whimsically, maybe not whimsically, but he floated, I don't know whether by tweet or otherwise, the idea that he was looking for people to help him begin developing the law of Mars. And that idea in its own right just made me sit back and say, what, what would it look like to develop a body of law for an entirely new social space? And that may be what has to happen uh, in this technology space that Keith uh, and I assume Aurora are also talking about uh, that where right now the the controls are are baked into designed into the technology itself, including the blockchain. Let, let, let me come back to you, Aurora. Um, you have chosen um, to borrow the identity of Aurora Munro from one of the Marvel uh, comics. Um, she says about herself, the true measure of life is in the living. It's, it isn't a series of do-overs and restarts. It's fighting for what you have, what you believe in. It's fighting for who you are. I am a mutant. I am a goddess and I want to live. Um, is the idea of this important when somebody like Elon Musk begins to imagine a law or a new series of laws for Mars? Do we need to shape the laws and culture according perhaps to a new species? Um, well, I certainly think Easy question, that, Aurora, right? <laughs> yeah, easy question, right. Um, well, I do not think what I should think about new species. But in general, I would say that the law should, if possible, not hinder, but support technological development, which by, as a byproduct also improves the development of the society. Um, so the question was not very clear to me, I have to say. Um, <laughs> Like I that's, really that's a polite way of telling me that uh, I, I should put my questions more clearly. Uh, I, I was just curious this this idea of the mutant and this seeming inevitable coming together of smart machines and human beings. This is part of the profound change that's shaping the world as well. Maybe not quite in the next week, but certainly in the next twenty or thirty years. Um, yes, for sure. I think that, and yeah, um, part of the reason why we choose a mutant and hero team is because we are different and we are um, like avant-garde to, to change um, the system and how the world is working, hopefully, by contributing to decent, like a society which is composed of decentralized organizations instead of large corporations and companies. 
which can um, easily control their um, development is leading. So the beauty with being decentralized, with being part of decentralized organization means that there is no, no central party dictate where the ship will sail to, but that everybody who has an interest and a stake in the system, that anybody who's participating with the service which is used, with the product which is built, with whatever the organization is doing, um, that everybody can participate and thereby those who are affected by what the organization is doing are having a right to decide what it is doing and where it is heading to. And um, you can see what mm, monopolies do in this world. Like you can see the finance system um, has been controlled by banks for what feels like forever for me at least because I'm not that old. <laughs> um, but I think it doesn't have to depend on my age that much. Oh, well, anyway, coming back to the topic. Um, so, um, have you ever been in India and have your bank accounts frozen? Or did you ever try to open a bank account in a developing country? It's awful. Mm, no, I, I, I've been to India, but I ne fortunately never tried to open a bank account there. I don't know about Keith or, uh, or Dave, whether you've done that. It's hard, to close, it's hard to close one as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get your point. Let me come to Keith Aurora. Um, Keith, let's come down to earth from Mars, from Aurora and mutants. Let's, let's test your thesis. In your excellent newsletter, which everyone should subscribe to, um, that was the week, you have a link to some news out of Africa that are, an African-focused VC fund has raised $50 million, but, uh, which is an interesting piece of news. But, Keith, you and I have talked and argued about this for years. I don't see much evidence of, of more decentralization. I see all the money in one place or maybe a couple of places, China and Silicon Valley. I see trillion-dollar companies like Amazon and Google. I see very little evidence of this fragmentation of power in the world. Perhaps you well, might on to that yeah so well firstly just a just a, a kind of a logical point interdependence is another word for, for oneness we are interdependent and there is a oneness about the human race but we're also divided and it feels to me as if the true individual only really can exist in that in a world where there is a oneness so you know when i flush my toilet there needs to be a sewage system um and if there isn't a sewage system which it takes lots of resources to it to exist you know i want to have a pleasant experience so the, the 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 individual requires a oneness and so decentralization isn't the same as atomization atomization is isolation uh, but decentralization is being yourself together. And, and I think they're very different things. So if you want evidence of being yourself together, it's all around you. I, I even think money will change. Um, one of the people I work, my wife's African, and I work with a couple of African-focused companies and one African VC from Nigeria, uh, Barbara Iai. And... Um, you know, it's a little known fact, but Nigeria is the fastest growing nation on earth and will be the third largest population on earth by 2050. And, and so the world is in flux, it's in change. Um, two thirds of the middle class in the world will be in Asia by 2050. And the middle class is who has assets. So American centricity, never mind British centricity from the last century, it, it, it cannot survive. It's inevitably going to go away. So we as individuals are living in this, this changing world. Now, how do we become one? We become one through common mechanisms, um, through things we, uh, uh, as, as uh, Aurora says, through trustless systems that we can trust. Um, and, and it feels to me as if the future world in which we all are individuals in this oneness 
relies on those systems existing, separate from having to trust any nation or political system, just because it works. Imagine, imagine um, as we move towards the end of work, as, as vehicles become self-driving, as writing becomes uh, something that AI does, um, and individuals don't need to have a job, how are we going to distribute the means of life to people globally through something close to a universal basic income? That's going to involve systems. And it feels to me as if the blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, are the very earliest forms of the systems that, that promote oneness and individualism. Let's wrap up. Um, Dave, do you agree with Keith about these systems being based on a new kind of trust? And if so, where's that gonna, trust going to come from? Seems to me, again, that we trust each other less and less uh, and that society, particularly America, is, is dominated by fundamental mistrust politically, culturally, sexually. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, let me back into it. Uh, on one level, in the United States right now, across the last five to 10 years, there is evident up on the surface of an enormous amount of distrust that has increased actually in division. But if you go down a level, the fundamental trust that uh, most Americans have in the quote unquote system. And towards Keith's, Keith's point, let's look at fiat currency. Uh, people still trust cash and credit cards and fiat currency behind that uh, uh, as much as they ever did. But if you do a deep dive, as I'm sure Keith probably has on it, you know, fiat currency maybe isn't as trustworthy as the trust that it's given to, that's given to it. So if you ask about trust in, let's say, crypto uh, on the blockchain, at first blush, it might seem like it's untrustworthy. But I would argue that objectively, the markers for trust in crypto, uh, assuming that the system is built well, and is sufficiently transparent to experts that trust is warranted and can be demonstrated. I think trust attaches to crypto pretty quickly. I think right now the reasons for, for distrust in the crypto space is twofold. One, nation states are uh, uh, criticizing it heavily. And number two, it still operates at this moment, in my opinion, more like a fluctuating investment security uh, uh, options trading than it does in a stable concern, uh, currency. But clearly, I don't think anybody disputes that at some point there will emerge one or several cryptocurrencies that will be uh, uh, eminently stable and reliable and thus trustworthy as, uh, as a legit currency and will presumably replace or work alongside fiat currency. So I'm not too worried about systems, human systems developing their methods of trust and people giving them the trust. A system that can't develop trust isn't going to, isn't going to succeed, you know, ab initio because of a design flaw of some sort. So trust becomes a central design function in any human system that you're building uh, or amending. Um, but I'm not too worried about that sort of sorting itself out um, amongst, uh, at the large scale. Uh, Aurora, final word from you. Um, do you see ultimately um, you at Sovereign and, and your other fellow uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum uh, uh, entrepreneurs being in the business of building trust, a new kind of trust, a distributed trust? I think that we shouldn't need to build trust at all, or if it's trust, and it's not trust in people, but just trust in technology. Because like I said earlier, that the beauty of building on blockchain and of build, constructing something with this technology is that you can verify 
anything which is happening. No party can manipulate what's happening. It's the rules are written in code. It's usually like in our case, it's reviewed by a lot of different parties. We're having third party auditors, we're having internal auditors or community members are looking over the code which we're doing. So um, you're not hiding anything. The code is open source and we cannot manipulate anything. Like the funds users are providing, if they are lending onto our system to earn yield on their Bitcoin, um, we cannot touch it. So the user deposits the funds. They are there, they're being used, they are generating yield, and only they can withdraw them. So it's a set of rules which is written, and users can be sure that as long as there's no error on the code, of course, which is always the biggest concern, nobody else is able to touch their money, to touch their funds, and they know that they can stay in control of what belongs to them all of the time. So they have financial sovereignty here. Well, I want to thank all of you. Uh, you've all done a wonderful job uh, in, 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 in trying circumstances. Uh, Dave Johnson, Aurora Munro, Keith Tier. that was the week. It was supposed to be the Bitcoin moment. I'm not sure if it really was the Bitcoin moment. There'll be many blockchain moments or Bitcoin moments or Ethereum moments, moments of trust. But I appreciate all of your contribution for a wonderful conversation about how the world is fundamentally changing. Thanks to all of you, and we'll have you back on the. Uh, we'll have you back on that was the week in the not too distant future uh, to talk about how technology is changing societies. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.